thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back in Helsinki. Um, so I'm going to go and talk about uh, Southern Africa uniquely, and this builds on some of the work that uh, Johannes already uh, presented. So we're going to focus on countries that are part of the Zambezi River Valley. Uh, so we've modeled the whole of the Zambezi River Valley in, in terms of runoff and so forth, and that Johannes already showed. Uh, and then we're going to look economically at uh, Zambia, Malawi, and, and Mozambique. And this builds on, as Ken was saying, uh, a series of efforts that we did uh, at WIDER that were targeted at a bunch of uh, different questions. Uh, the questions that we were looking at originally are things like, you know, what are the implications of climate change for growth and development prospects to about 2050 uh, in terms of these, these three countries? What are the impact channels? Um, what options are available to try to uh, adapt or reduce uh, impacts? And that was all <laughs> published in a special issue, and there have been other ongoing work uh, in the region. This presentation, we want to focus on just, just sort of one question and one issue, which is what are the implications of effective global mitigation for the case of, of the economies, of these economies, by 2050? And, uh, and Johannes gave you a, a preview of, uh, of some of those results, so we're going to look at that. And so I'm going to leap forward to, to the conclusions, tell you what I, what I decide, and then we're going to um, uh, uh, sort of uh, provide some more detail on those conclusions because uh, now there's more papers coming out. This was really one of the first papers to really try to address this issue of what are the relatively short run uh, impacts of, of uh, uh, reducing emissions by 2050. Uh, so the, we find that the effective global mitigation generates two sources of benefit even by 2050. First, we get less distorted climate outcomes, uh, and they're generally more favorable, and there's less variability, which is uh, consistent with what Johannes showed. Um, the second is that uh, successful global mitigation policies reduce uh, fossil fuel prices, uh, especially oil, uh, the producer prices. And as a consequence, uh, structural fuel importers, uh, such as the countries in the Zambezi River Valley, get a, a terms of trade benefit, and it's, it's quite significant. So we're going to use this multi-sector modeling framework that, that Ken was mentioning. mentioning. This is the, the sacred framework. At the top, we have global change. <coughs> This is driven by a, a sort of a combined climate and economic model that's going to produce for us precipitation, temperature. It also produces global product prices, so it's going to produce for us the oil price, it's going to produce for us agricultural uh, prices on a, on a global basis. And we, then we spread that into particular regions, and so we get uh, uh, rainfall turning into runoff and stream flow. This might have implications for, for flooding. Uh, in, in Mozambique you, and other places, you have sea level rise, which is in, uh, interacting, as in the case of Florence, uh, with, with cyclones and, and, and storm surges. Uh, over here, this is what Johannes focused on. What does it do for hydropower? What does this do for, for agriculture uh, in terms of, of crop yields and production? Uh, what are implications for infrastructure? So it's quite a detailed look. At, at what climate change uh, might mean or do. And then we take it and we sum it all up and, and get the interactions within a full economy model of each of the countries uh, in focus so that we're able to you know, really get a notion of, of, what's, of what's happening. We're using uh, the uncertainty approach uh, developed at, at MIT. And these are, we're going to 2050, these are temperature outcomes globally uh, in 2100. And, and this is the big, this is the, the, what we want to avoid, which is a no policy or, or what we're calling unconstrained uh, emissions. And this is the distribution of potential sort of uh, the range of outcomes that are expected. And this is more or less, it was published a little while ago, 2009, but this is more or less what we still have uh, roughly today, uh, which is, you know, uh, unacceptably large uh, uh, temperature uh, uh, gains by the end of the of this century, so you know, median or a mode of around uh, five degrees centigrade, which is which is really quite quite a lot. And and you note that this is uh, what we call level one stabilization. This is also what Johannes focused on. This is about 450 parts per million CO2. Add in some other greenhouse gases like methane, and you're getting to about 560 parts per million CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. And this corresponds with a you know, more favorable outcome, some of them below kind of 2 degrees centigrade. That's compared with 81 to 2,000. 
But, but the, the point of the matter is that this distribution here is extremely distinct from that distribution there. So you know, obviously, mitigation over this century matters really a lot for the, what kind of climate we get at the end of the century. And, uh, but it's, it's also the case that even by about 2050, it, it matters materially. Uh, so those distributions, that, that separation doesn't just occur right at the end of the century. It occurs, you know, it's, they're starting to separate throughout the century. And, uh, and so this is uh, December, this is temperature in the summer. So this would be uh, January, February, March. Um, temperatures, uh, and we can see that under unconstrained emissions, you have you know, higher temperatures and a greater variation in the, in the temperature outcomes at around 2050. If you go to precipitation, you get the same result. Generally, unconstrained emissions in level one stabilization, and this is in the spring, uh, yeah, September, October, November. Um, generally, we're getting some drying in the, in the spring, but the drying under unconstrained emissions is, is more pronounced, and the, there's higher variance in the range of outcomes. So there's just sort of more uncertainty in what might actually happen uh, if, we, if we continue to, to put uh, uh, the same amount of uh, 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 greenhouse gases into the, into the atmosphere. Uh, this is pretty consistent with what Johannes was talking about. These are the runoff anomalies or, or changes in levels of runoffs at various points in the, in the, uh, in the Zambezi River Valley. And, and what you see is, is you know, distributions that, that sort of vary more or less around zero. Sometimes there's less runoff here. Sometimes there's a little bit more, such as, such as here, uh, up here in the uh, uh, Shire. Uh, generally, we get uh, uh, greater variance in the, in the blue curves. So these are, are, are again, distribution functions. So there's, there's sort of greater likelihood of, uh, or a, a broader distribution of, of outcomes. And, uh, and in all of these cases, we have these tails where runoff goes up by, by quite a bit, and this is on an annual basis. But you also have these kinds of tails of, of, of big increases in runoff at, at, shorter, at shorter time steps. So one of the things that we find, and, and, and particularly in, in Mozambique, which is sort of already being observed, is um, big changes in, in flood probabilities and, and floods being uh, uh, you know, really uh, potentially damaging, as you know, North Carolina is finding out sort of right now. Um, uh, so, under level one stabilization, we get an increase in in the sort of number of greater than fifty year floods that we would expect, uh, you know, in in any one year. But under uh, unconstrained emissions, that that really uh, increases quite a bit. And Mozambique is a downstream. Uh, country, it's the you know the farthest to the east, and so it's picking up um, you know a lot of this variation. It's also um, quite flat, and uh, and that's that's pretty damaging. So you know to to skip to you know one end result in in respecting the the time. Um, these are this is the kind of implication that we get for GDP in 2050. And uh, so this, again, this is a density. So this is some kind of measure of likelihood of the outcome. This is uh, a change in the de a deviation from some kind of mythical no climate change baseline, uh, which, is, which is set here. And what we find is that you know, there is some probability of, of positive outcomes, right? It's, it's possible that uh, you know, it could warm up, but, but you still get more GDP than you would have otherwise. Uh, but the great likelihood is that you get a reduction in GDP somewhere in the range of zero to five percent. And we focus merely on GDP as, as, as a matter of time uh, and being able to compare. And then we have this kind of bad tail of outcomes, and that's corresponding to this big potential increase in, in flood probability. So if you're just getting floods, you know, on a repeated basis that are washing out infrastructure, your, your growth prospects are, are, are reduced uh, pretty substantially. So this bad tail here of, of outcomes is the consequence of that increase in, in flood probability. Uh, if you have uh, successful global uh, mitigation, you end up sort of reducing the variable, so you, you shift the distribution to the right, uh, 
you get fewer impacts. Uh, and this is, this is purely uh, all we're doing here is changing the, uh, the climate scenario. We're not changing the economic scenario at all. So this is purely a temperature and rainfall kind of, kind of impact, a climate impact. And, and so we shift the distribution off to the right and we tighten it dramatically as a consequence of, uh, uh, of, of a sort of a more certain uh, uh, climate future. So that, that's one set of benefits. The other set of benefits that we oh, uh, get are these um, world price effects. So the most significant one that emerges out of, out of the, the modeling exercises is, in, is in really in the price of oil, which is the major traded uh, uh, energy commodity. So, you know, as, as has been observed by many at this point, and this is starting to show up in the literature as well. So right now, if we're going to limit um, global temperature rises to about two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial, we, we can only burn about up to one third, say, of proven reserves, what we already have uh, in the ground. So that would mean that if we're going to do that, then uh, we have to leave two thirds in the ground. Uh, and this changes the economics of oil extraction you know, quite substantially. So if, uh, you know, as soon as Saudi Arabia cons you know, cons uh, 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 considers or believes that you know, uh, only one third of proven reserves can actually be burned, then they have an incentive to get rid of their reserves uh, quite quickly and sell them while, while, they, while they can. Um, so uh, otherwise those reserves would be, would be stranded. So uh, for this reason, so this, this then comes in at the, at the top. This is the world product prices, and this is coming out of the, uh, the EPA model uh, developed at MIT. And this is what EPA shows, and there's you know, a lot of reasons to be uh, worried about, uh, to, to talk about this, but this is the ratio of the price of oil under unconstrained, uh, under level one stabilization to unconstrained emissions. And under unconstrained emissions, basically the price of oil is rising uh, more or less throughout the century. Um, so price is what's holding it back. In uh, under level one stabilization, you've either got policy or other factors uh, constraining the, the consumption of oil and you're getting a lot less consumption and so you, you have a lower price. Um, other, other products are, are moving around less. In, in, in oil, you tend to take a lot of impact in price and not quite as much in quantity because there's a fair amount of profit involved in extracting oil. So Saudi Arabia extracts at $5 a barrel and sells at $65 a barrel. They're perfectly willing to keep producing at $35 a barrel. Uh, in, with, with coal extraction, your, your price is much closer to your marginal cost. So uh, there isn't that much price effect. There's a lot of quantity effect, however, uh, if, you're, if you're limiting. And with natural gas, we get this funny uh, bend because natural gas generally emits less, so you end up with uh, shifting to natural gas early on in the process, and then you shift away from natural gas. And then this is really a carbon capture and storage effect from, from 2050, which is, which is sort of assumed. Um, so we also assume in this, so we impose these fossil fuel prices out to 2050. We also assume in this case, and this is partly because we think this is true and partly because there's just only so much we can cram into one uh, already quite complex model, um, that we have special and different differential treatment of these mostly low-income countries. Uh, so the world successfully mitigates. Our case economies, Mozambique, Malawi, and Zambia, uh, are exempted, so we're not, they're not mitigating directly uh, within our models. And we have, just to keep things uh, also a little bit simpler, if you follow Mozambique, you know that there's a major coal find, a major natural gas find, and, and we, those are still in process of being uh, developed. It's very hard to know what's actually going to happen, so we just abstract from those. So here's what we get. Um, so once we add that back in and we get this big reduction in, in global fuel prices at, at import, uh, this uh, imports of, of fuels in Mozambique are about 12 percent of, of total imports. Fuels and derived products, uh, up to 20 percent of, of total imports. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a significant uh, uh, import item, and getting it cheaper uh, uh, gives you a, a significant terms of trade benefit, which results in basically more investment, more growth, and it, and it shows up pretty strongly by, uh, by 2050. 
uh, we get the same effect, the same sets of effects in Malawi. So in Malawi, you don't get quite as much, there's not as much climate change impact overall. Um, you do get the tightening of the distribution. You shift it to the right. This is the pure precipitation and uh, um, uh, temperature effect. And then we get uh, another jump. Malawi has a structural fuel importer uh, being able to, to import fuels uh, uh, less expensively. It's the same story in Zambia with slightly different look. Um, the distributions aren't, the variance isn't reduced quite as much. There is variance reduction, but it's not quite as apparent. But again, the same qualitative story where we get a slightly tighter distribution, we shift it to the right, and then we shift it to the right again uh, with respect to uh, the, um, the fossil fuel price effect. So our conclusions are, as I said, effective global uh, mitigation generates two sources of benefit, one more certain uh, and, and more favorable economic outcomes by 2050. Um, second, we get terms of trades effects that, that especially African low-income economies often benefit from quite strongly. So I have in now, uh, that was the end of this presentation, but there was a new paper that came out last month, <laughs> so, so just recently, looking at the same issue, and, uh, and they come up with, uh, they don't focus on GDP, they focus on food security, uh, but they, they worry about an increased risk of, of food insecurity under stringent global, trim, global climate change um, mitigation policy. Uh, and this is driven by, and coming, this is coming straight out of their article, um, relatively mild climate change impacts by 2050. Uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, in these older mitigation scenarios, quite a bit of bioenergy that comes in under a, a, a uh, a, a stringent uh, global climate change mitigation policy. That bioenergy competes for land, it competes for water, and it drives up uh, food prices. Um, uh, and then in this particular case, uh, not only is, our, is the carbon tax imposed on uh, uh, emissions from energy sources like electricity generation, it's imposed on agriculture as well. Uh, which, is, which is quite hard. So you, you have a, 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 a production type effect, even in low income economies. So why is it that we get uh, such, I think they are quite different. We would get increased, we would get increased food security and, and they're getting less. And there's, there's a number of reasons. Right off the top, they have, they're, they're imposing all of the mitigation even on low income economies, whereas we're not. And that's, that's one significant uh, difference. But there are some other differences which I think are important and we need to do um, some more uh, work. The, the first is, you know, there's just not as much, uh, there's not as much detail in the impact modeling. And so they're tending to get uh, a little bit less impact because they're looking at fewer channels. They're not, they're not picking up everything that's happening. So as a consequence, when you get the benefits of mitigation, you have, you have smaller impacts to begin with and, uh, and you don't get as much benefit from, from the mitigation. Uh, that, that you do observe. So that's, that's one effect. The other um, uh, effect, which is uh, something that, that I, especially in the, the models used, the global models that used for the IPCC, there are two potential impact channels from food price increases. The first is, if your food price goes up and all you do is buy food, then you are worse off, right? You know, this is basically me, right? Food prices go up, I buy food, um, that's bad for me. It's not very bad for me because I don't, you know, my, my share of consumers. But for urban poor consumers who are working in service sectors in the urban area, a higher food price is, is typically going to reduce their, their food, you know, but ability to buy and increase food, food, food uh, insecurity. In rural areas, it's a, it's a completely different story in that most economic activity is involved, is selling food. So, you know, if you're selling wheat and the wheat price goes up, your, the price of bread might go up a little bit, but your income is likely to offset that. Uh, and what we find in most literature, the 2008-2009 food price crisis and, and the continuing uh, high food prices, is that because most uh, people who are food insecure are in rural areas, this income effect uh, tends to outweigh the, the consumption effect. And that as a consequence, actually, higher food prices uh, 
improve food security because uh, you get, you're getting greater wages in agricultural production in rural, in rural zones. So this shows up both theoretically and in the empirics that we do have. And one of the problems with the models that looked at this Hasegawa et al. and, and others, this is a multi-model study, is, is that impact channel just doesn't even exist. Um, there is no way that higher food prices could increase income and come back around and, and, and improve food, food, food security. It just, it just doesn't happen. Whereas in the, in the framework that we're using, it does. Um, the final thing that, that happens is often either the model just doesn't have fuel at all. It's an agricultural sector model. So many of these in this paper would be looking at the agricultural sector uniquely. There is no fuel price. It doesn't exist. If it does exist, it's in a general equilibrium model, typically. And, uh, and that model often, you know, because it's so broad in terms of products, it's, it becomes uh, more aggregate in terms of areas. So often they will use sub-Saharan Africa as one aggregate region. And if you think of sub-Saharan Africa as one aggregate region inside a model, then it's basically the South African economy with oil. You know, that's it. <laughs> it's South Africa and Nigeria combined. Uh, and, uh, and, and so actually that aggregate region is a net oil um, exporter. So it's completely different from the situation which most low-income countries find themselves in and where most poor people would be living. Ethiopia, for example, is you know, one of the most populous countries in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, the most populous low-income country, and it is a structural fuel importer, but that effect would be, uh, would be completely disguised. So there's work to be done uh, to, 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 uh, to, to work through this, this full uh, set of issues, but, but that's, that's where I wanted to uh, uh, end the talk today. So thank you. I'd like to open the floor for specific questions for Channing on his presentation. Thank you. Um, so my question picks up a little bit on, on your own comments just there about um, the, the spatial and temporal disaggregation. So uh, I'm interested specifically in your research about how the models, uh, how you translate changes in, in climate risk and weather risk into economic impact and whether you're imposing your different uh, climate scenarios on essentially the same economic scenarios or is there any Essentially, is there any adaptation on the economic side as the scenarios change? And then maybe as a broader point, if the effects are so heterogene heterogeneous across space, uh, we see kind of longer-term modeling suggests, so uh, Esteban Rossi Hansberg has some models showing, you know, if, if, pe if we allow movement across space, we can uh, reduce or minimize climate impacts. Um, that's in the very long term. My own research in the short term shows that following flooding, people don't tend to relocate, they go back uh, to the same places. So I, I'm just interested about the, how the modeling and the empirics kind of uh, come together and how the short run and the long run come together and we, we kind of bridge those divides. Thanks. Very interesting actually what you mentioned about the modeling uh, you know, uh, structure. And you mentioned that the, you, you have the ability to capture the temporal dimension uh, for less than a year. I just want to know how is this implemented if, um, as far as I know, that the, the economic model is uh, kind of an annual model. So if it is a CGE model, then it, it, it is dependent on a, on a SAM and that is based on an um, annual data. I would like to see how do you go for less than a year uh, impact. And my, my other question to Ant is about the uh, food price impact. And, and you mentioned that Yes, higher food prices might um, be positive for rural households who basically produce food and they sell it. But uh, how do you then go with uh, the majority of rural small-scale households who basically produce food for own consumption and they produce cash, cash crops for, for the sale? And therefore, the, 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 the higher food prices might still be negative for them. Thank you. We have one more question in the back. Thank you, Yerusalem uh, from Brookings Institution. Um, uh, I was struck by the difference uh, on the impact of uh, climate change on food security, uh, specifically on the, pr the price effect. Uh, the last uh, commentator also mentioned the impact of uh, uh, food price on uh, food security. And 
net importers. I was wondering if 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 you took uh, the model took into consideration that most rural uh, households in Africa are uh, are not net uh, are, are they are net importers of food. So I would assume the impact on uh, food security comes from more from the production shock than the, the price, given that they are net importers of food. Thank you. So Channing, if you could address these three. Yeah, good questions. Um, uh, so this is the framework that, that we used. You know, it's not perfect, of course, um, but uh, or it's not up there. Uh, I, I, um, anyway, so we have the uh, sort of a global model. We're reasonably well doing well in terms of linking. So the the there's a the global CG model that's producing the emissions. The emissions are going into a a model of intermediate complexity for the for the climate, which is then producing our our climate outcomes. So we're linked up there. Um, the, the, it's very detailed on, on, on energy, of course, because partly used for, for mitigation purposes. It, it has agriculture in there, but it's, it's fairly aggregate, so we don't get that much in the way of differentials across you know, products. It's, it's, a, it's an agriculture um, aggregate, right? Those outcomes are coming, and I forget the exact time step, but, but it's, a, it's a pretty close uh, 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 time step. And that, that's being fit, fed into models that, that will have you know, relatively short-term time steps. The, the, you know, Johannes could talk a lot about the kind of river and stream flow uh, models that we use. But you know, the crop models actually will, will take inputs at shorter time steps than, than we're able to, to produce, right? Uh, and they'll do it across, uh, 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 you know, across space. So we, we get to handle with a fair amount of detail what's going on uh, both spatially and, and temporally, right? And we could handle, for example, um, uh, you know, precipitations coming in, in similar amounts but later in the year, right? And at different different temperature levels. Um, so, so that kind of stuff we can handle. The flooding is inherently fairly short time step. Um, and that, that you know, uh, uh, there, there's work to be done to make that, to make that um, better. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, in, in terms of, of that, that aspect, it's there. Uh, the, the model, what we show here is uh, there is a fair amount of internal or autonomous adaptation that's that's happening right so um, the we'll, we'll take the crop model and we'll largely convert to some kind of a productivity measure and but then the model decides okay you know if if you're able to move production we're, we're regionally differentiated in production uh, across activities uh, so uh, if, if, if the north is is well uh, suited for you know, better going to be better for growing maize than than the center uh, as as the climate is evolving. Then then we're going to get an autonomous move into the north as opposed to to the center. Um, this is happening. That that gets to your second question, which is the movement across space. Um, in these models, at this moment, it's it's not there's not a lot of friction, right? So uh, uh, we we do get a fair amount of movement. Uh, and this showed up less here than in, than in the South Africa work that we did, where it shows up really quite strongly. Uh, now, is it unrealistic? Uh, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure. I think the, the, the argument, the counter argument is, we are looking at fairly long periods of time here and, and pretty young populations. Right. So, you know, uh, yeah, if you're 30 years old and you've been farming here for 18 years and then, you know, you're probably likely to be staying where you are. You have your family and your house and so on and so forth. But but you're at the, the, the long end of the population distribution. Most of the population coming in is, is 15, right? 50 percent of the population below 15 in these in these countries. And, uh, and you know, you're going to be getting married and figuring out where it is you're going to live. And if there's areas that are that are doing better than others, one of the things that we do find in, in now uh, is, a, is a fair amount of migration between rural areas. As uh, as as you know, conditions change, and this is, I think, partly due to these young population dynamics. So, so it's it's not over the time frames that we're talking about. I, I think I think that's that's plausible because we're not we're not moving everybody. We're just moving at at the um, at the margin. 
Um, yeah, so I've done those. Okay, yeah. Uh, yes, it's true. Most, many, many rural households, if not most, would be, you know, often net buyers or they're, they're producing for their own account and they're not, uh, uh, you know, selling. Um, or, you know, we were, I spoke very much about food prices and they may be, they're not really selling much food, they're selling other cash crops off, off, into the, off into the economy. So if we go back first to the, to the drivers that's being you know, put, uh, pointed to uh, for most of these food insecurity things, uh, it's greater competition for land and greater competition for water, the fixed factors that are inside of, of agriculture. So those, 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 those competition factors are gonna affect cash crops as well as food crops, and you're gonna see, you know, you get the same, get the same effect. Whether, you know, how strong it is and how varied it is, that, that's different, and you, you would have to model that, but, but you would get this kind of cash crop uh, uh, effect. <coughs> the, the, if you're going to be positively affecting most rural households, then some things have to be happening other than just the first order instance of the price rise, right, because you're, you're you're a net buyer of, of food, and you might not be selling much uh, cash crop. Uh, and what, what tends to be happening is uh, you, you do get supply response as a, as a consequence of higher agricultural prices. Uh, this kicks in, we, 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 we do observe it, so you're generally uh, improving. And then that supply response is converting into uh, a labor market effect, right? So most of these households, I mean, if they're sitting out there, and they need to buy food, and they're not selling it, they gotta be selling something in order to, to have the income in order to buy the food. Often they're selling their labor. So if they're getting better wages, then, then they can, if that wage is going up by more than food price, they're going to, they're going to uh, be able to buy more food. And that is, you know, again, this isn't an area of research, you know, where we know for sure that that's what's happening. But the analyses that have been done when you look at, in detail, at say the big rise in food prices that occurred from 2003 to about 2013-14, uh, generally you're getting uh, positive uh, effects on, on food security because you're stimulating the rural economy where most uh, poor people are actually living, right? And that, that's, that's what's going on. Thank you.